when we started data ethics, our twin mantras were data rights are human rights and social problems are data problems. But in most data conversations, human rights hardly comes up as a topic. And in dealing with the human rights sector, data is not the first thing they think about when they do their work. Welcome to Data Ethics Conversations. Today, we talk to attorney Paco Camacho, Senior Program Officer for Law and Human Rights. We will talk to Paco about breaking down the study of human rights into a study of power relationships in society, and also the emerging role of data in human rights discourse. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like it on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at EthicsPH, and on LinkedIn at DataEthicsPH. And now, my conversation with attorney Paco Camacho. Hi, right, thanks, Doc. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, this is a... Uh... I hope to impart some interesting insights uh, for this uh, episode. Um, and these are serious uh, topics, human rights and data. So there's definitely a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, before we, we get to your kind of your topic, uh, maybe share with our viewers a little bit about yourself, like a background and, and what brought you to this conversation between data ethics. No? Yeah, so um, I'm a lawyer by profession, um, but... I've been working on human rights issues uh, for almost eight years now, uh, mostly when it comes to human rights protection and accountability. Uh, I've worked with prosecutors, judges, <laughs> the entire judicial um, system or justice system rather, uh, trying to get um, serious cases of human rights violations moving uh, through the different stage of uh, criminal proceedings. I actually started my human rights work um, before I became a lawyer. Uh, I worked on human rights issues relating to um, indigenous people's uh, land and resource rights. So a lot of lobbying, a lot of filing strategic litigation cases, um, but things really got serious for me in the human rights space when I became involved in uh, a project implemented by the Asia Foundation. Uh, so the Asia Foundation is a is a an international NGO with presence in around eighteen countries uh, across Asia, and in the Philippines um, it has been operating for around seventy plus years. Seventy, so, wow. yeah, seventy plus years. <laughs> um, so it's been here for a long time, and uh, one of its focus areas is really human rights and governance in general. So I got involved in one of the, their projects um, where they were building up cases for. Uh, incidents of serious human rights violations. Mm. So the, the Department of Justice was forming a team of dedicated prosecutors who were really just you know, collecting evidence and building up cases so that they can prosecute these sensational uh, um, incidences of, of human rights violations. This was around 10 years back, um, no, around uh, maybe eight years ago, I think. Um, but yeah, so the Jovito Palparan case, right. the Jerry Ortega case, um, the heinous cases, no? yeah, yeah, very sensational uh, cases, um, the killing of Father Pop Stentorio in in um, South Cotabato. So that's where I started the the hardcore litigation um, accountability programs of the Asia Foundation, and then you know human rights programming evolve uh, over time. So from, you know, doing this uh, very uh, targeted interventions for human rights accountability, we ventured um, to providing the access to legal services for those who are most vulnerable to human rights violations. So, you know, children, uh, women, uh, in, in particularly in contexts of, you know, armed conflict or internal displacement, um, just providing assistance to victims of um, extrajudicial killings, for instance, more recently. Um, and then slowly my, my, my responsibilities um, grew to become more forward facing, uh, such that now my work on human rights revolve around promoting uh, human rights to a public, to a wider audience. It's a more, um, a more communications uh, kind of role no? or yeah, communications, campaigns, yeah, advocacy. AR, yeah. Yeah. So from working with just prosecutors and you know, 
specific cases. Um, now, um, and this is still with the Asia Foundation, uh, promoting human rights across um, uh, various audiences. So that's essentially where I met um, the folks uh, from data ethics, um, because we are collecting a lot of data. We are working with a lot of partners uh, and you know, we, we want to, to make sure that um, how we're collecting data, how we're processing data um, is really up to par when it comes to, you know, the, 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 the ethical standards that, that you want to uphold. So yeah, that's why we're in this conversation because uh, human rights and data these days can't be separated. You know, they're, they're really intertwined. Yeah, you know, if I can just react to that now. Um, uh... I, this is speaking from uh, my own background. Like I came from a uh, data analyst background in the, in the commercial space. So obviously when uh, we went, we forayed, uh, my own career forayed now into social impact. I have to admit that, and I think a lot of our viewers can relate to this, uh, human rights is kind of off the beaten track <laughs> for, for, for data people. But what, uh, what I've... I guess pleasantly surprised found that data is very much a relevant topic uh, when we talk about human rights. So uh, in a way, there's like two, at, at least for me, you know, there's at least two tracks to that. One track is human rights as a field is full of data itself. No? Uh, and, and as you said, there, is, there needs to, I guess they're not, there's now a clamor to be a bit more uh, rigorous about it. Uh, you know, I was just in an event uh, organized by the UP Journalism Club a couple of days ago, and uh, Carlos Conde of Human Rights Watch was there, no? and even he said the bulk of the research they do is qualitative, and what we're finding is there's a lot about human rights that we can be quantitative about, and it's not necessarily replacing qualitative uh, you know, assessments, it can be merged, so that's one track, and then the second track is the data itself attracts Human rights issues, no privacy, security, uh, you know, ethical use, bias. Uh, nga one of our mantras is data rights uh, are synonymous now with human rights you know, and social challenges, social problems are also data challenges and data problems. I uh, can't be more true now uh, than today, no. Uh, yeah, so I think this to topic is quite timely, and thank you for for I don't know uh, responding to our invitation. You know, I know it's uh. It's a it's a small spot in your otherwise busy schedule, but thanks for you know coming today and you know, taking time to share some of your work. Yeah, of course, it's, it's my pleasure. Actually, um, I hope I can impart something new, um, unique insights, hopefully. <laughs> um, but yeah, excited to be here. Um, and yeah, I just like to echo that. Um, yeah, uh, human rights uh, and data are really intricately intertwined. I, I know that now as, a, as someone that's more involved in public facing human rights programs. Before, when you work on um, hard human rights um, issues, say extrajudicial killings and case buildup and you know, going to courts, data was just confined to the realm of evidence. That's it. That's how you look at data, just the evidence that you present in court so that you can secure a conviction. But now, as an advocate, as a campaigner, as someone who who's trying to build movements around several human rights issues, you realize that data is really um, um, uh, everywhere in, 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 in my line of work and definitely um, is, is a human rights issue in, in and of itself, how we collect and use data. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you, you wanted to show, I, I guess you're uh, in the middle of your slide deck. You want to go through it and let's see uh, the story behind this. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about human rights and data um, very broadly, very quickly. Um, but really, I hope to share um, a perspective about human rights and data, which I think um, will be um, new to your, to your listeners or to your viewers. Um, and this is really you know, at the core of what human rights is. So I, I'll dedicate a few minutes uh, on talking about what human rights is in the most concise way I can, or at least I'll try. Um, because there are many ways to think about uh, human rights. So perhaps the most um, dominant way uh, of thinking about human rights is in terms of the legal lens, right? So legal prohibitions or legal guarantees 
what one can do and what the liabilities are for violations. Uh, but you know, some people view human rights from a moralistic perspective um, as you know, entitlements from God owing to our attributes as say children of God. Um, some view human rights from a practical standpoint, like human rights are there uh, to, to, to give us the best arrangement to achieve real human goals, better life, better economic development, more innovation and technology. Um, but I'd like to think about, personally now, I'd like to think about human rights as a way of thinking about power uh, relations. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's not as abstract as it seems, but, you know, one way of thinking about it is that, and this is a core tenet of human rights, is that everyone is created equal, right? That's, that's really the, the foundational tenet of human rights in general whether you look at it from a moralistic perspective or a practical standpoint, or even from a legal slash constitutional um, standpoint, everyone is created equal. But not everyone occupies equal power positions, be it because of your you know, function as a, as, a, as a citizen or because of your um, employment or your, the conditions of your birth, not everyone occupies equal power positions. And this is the fundamental uh, assumption of human rights, that um, those in power will abuse that power. This is a, a very valuable lesson that history has given us. And for me personally, you know, it's, it's, it's indisputable almost. It's almost a historical fact that those in power will abuse that power. And we've seen this over and over again from, you know, I don't know, Julius Caesar to Napoleon to um, Hitler to Marcos, uh, even to a police director who holds uh, Manganita in the middle of a pandemic, right? Those in power will tend to abuse that power. We know this. It happens. It's, it's, it's almost inevitable. So, and, 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 this, and, and this imbalance in, in power uh, relations is most um, striking, most... Um, most felt, most evident in uh, the relationship between the state and the individual. So this is the relationship or the power imbalance that is also most vulnerable to abuse. You know, the, the state in relation to an individual carries immense powers. You know, they, the, the, the government levies taxes, they can declare access crimes, you know, they, they, they can tell, you know, let's go to war or whatever. Um, and an individual really doesn't have any sort of power that even approximates the level of power that the state has. Um, it might sound abstract, no? but in practical terms, human rights views power relationships in this way. A policeman versus a farmer. In terms of power, the policeman has you know, the, the legal license to kill, to arrest, to search, to conduct an investigation, to file cases, and a farmer doesn't, right? And if that power of the policeman goes unchecked, and, and if history tells us that those in power will tend to abuse the power, how can we correct the, the, the asymmetry or, or that imbalance? Um, this is why human rights, you know, you can think of it in so many ways, but at the core of it, for me personally at least, or the school of thought I, I subscribe to, is that human rights is really a way of equalizing power uh, relations. That's why um, a policeman can't, because of human rights, a policeman can't just kill anyone. It has to be like a last resort when there's grave and imminent threat to the policeman's life. They can't search a house without a search warrant, or in most instances anyway, or they can't arrest anyone unless there's an arrest warrant or a crime is being committed um, um, in the view of the, the law enforcer. So, can I, can I can interject here? I think this is yeah. a very, very pun intended, powerful, uh, uh -huh. fundamental concept about, especially the point about if there's a power imbalance uh, or, or people with power would at some point eventually abuse it. I wonder though, this might be a bit on the philosophical side, what is the default state of things is it the is is it is it the default state for for power to abuse 
or is the default state to be in equilibrium and the construct is to kind of you know try to get more power or is there is or is that even relevant as a conversation because what we're saying is if there is an abuse this whole field and discipline of human rights is parang correcting that abuse or correcting that imbalance uh, but if 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 that imbalance is kind of the natural state of things uh, you know won't doesn't that well, I mean, I, I don't know what that implies no, for the practice of human rights in general. Parang you're trying to fight uh, a tide no, that uh, kind of it's natural forces at play. I don't know if that's even a relevant question for... I mean, well, how would you interpret that no, as a practitioner in the, in the field? Are, we, are, are yeah. you fighting a natural state? <laughs> yeah, from a philosophical perspective, you know, so like John Locke or all these you know, um, <laughs> uh, philosophers would argue that the natural state is really one of... Um, uh, um, one of competition uh, for resources, for power, for, for power, and and really, the goal of, of of human civilization is to create a structure or to create an environment where there's least harm, or to put it in other words, not mo- um, the most number of people will get the most good. Parang ganon yung pilas um uh, trajectory ng ng philosophy natin on human rights. But there are different schools of thought here. You know, if you talk to Mar- Marxists, uh, they'll, 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 or communists, or those who have left-leaning um, uh, um, positions, they'd argue that the, 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 the natural state of things is really of conflict and of, you know, a desire to, to, to monopolize. And we see, you know, this also in, in, in capitalist thinking, you know, and, and, and the liberal thought. Um, so, but as a as a human rights practitioner, we personally, I don't, I don't have to decide on which philosophy is more correct or less wrong. Um, but you know, the state of affairs that we find ourselves in in our everyday lives is something that concerns me because the imbalance is there already. No matter how we got here, no matter you know. Um, the the trajectory that we took, the imbalance is there, and we see it every day in the news, even in our families, you know, in our communities. Um, there's really the tendency to to abuse power, and you're right. You know, it's a it's like fighting against uh, a tide, right? Every day, there's always that urge to abuse, or that opportunity rather to abuse. And sometimes human rights is a is a is an effective uh, way to to stop that abuse. But you know, as with technology, for instance, as soon as you know human rights protocols or norms are in place, it has already been circumvented because of just that innovation and all you know the unstoppable force of um, human progress, so to speak. Um, which is uh, and and human rights always finds itself on the back foot trying to cope. Uh, and, and and trying to put up a, a, a defense, but Actually, yeah, I know. Um, and, and sorry, apologies if this is another digression. Uh, I'm keeping you from your topic, but it just brought to mind uh, another. This is a recurring theme actually that came up in several other conversations. That when we bring conversation to the ethical realm, no? the ethical realm, human rights, the political realm, one. I don't know if this is really a flaw, but one one common trope. That we have in our current, our current, let's say, a legal system, no? is the, the notion of justice. What about justice is you want to right or wrong, no? you want to correct a disbalance. Often redounds to economics. <laughs> Kunyari, you know, I got hurt, I guess I got damaged. The ultimate solution is I'll pay you na lang, no? pay you off, no? to. So that's the only restitution you can get, no. So if it's not resti- restitutive form of you know compensation uh, then there's also the punitive type now so yeah, I'm gonna put you to jail or an eye for an eye I mean the reason why I'm, I, I just brought that up is these systems don't seem to be doing the job because <laughs> these injustices keep persisting no so something's wrong uh, and, and it pops up because when we do the data gathering it's very glaring no uh, okay there are there are sectors of society that continually get abused, no? and there are sectors of society that continually abuse. So there's that, parang that curve, no? 
and somehow the the mechanisms we have i mean you as a lawyer would be very familiar with these no? civil civil cases criminal cases but somehow it doesn't seem to be i don't know maybe it's my limited understanding lang then uh doesn't seem to be making that impact or or somehow it's exponential as society grows the magnitude of the injustice keeps growing and Anyway, I don't want to paint too gloom a picture. I just wanted to bring that up because it affects me deeply as a data person operating in the human rights sphere. Eh? Kasi I came from, let's say, an accounting background. Though. I came from finance. There's always this uh, need in accounting to balance your, ba- balance your budget, balance your balance sheet, balance your income and expenses. So at some point, you have to reckon it down to the last centavo. It's very, very straightforward in finance. No? Okay. There's a... If there's a if there's a lack of funding, then the, it's either a liability or you have to put up some equity, parang gano, Then you balance it off. But then when you bring it to human rights, I'm not sure if the calculus works just as well. Eh? But yeah. somehow there's that notion of oh, sige, we're gonna compensate you by paying you off, parang insurance. Uh, at some point, the number becomes infinite. And that's my my sense though that no amount. Will really pay off the the grievous wrong be, that was done to you, no? Uh, and again, that just adds to the in my head the headache of trying to to wrangle human rights, no? I don't know. Do you agree, pala? I'm sorry to rant, no? Just <laughs> just reacting reacting like that, no? No, I mean, yeah, the um, tama ka, no? like, the violations keep happening, um, and the more complex society becomes, the more difficult it is to prevent certain um, human rights violations um, because these have not been anticipated before. But for me, like the optimistic part of me says that if we didn't have human rights as an ideal or as a, as a, as a guarantee, you know, how, how bad could things be at the moment? You know, if we didn't even have that sort of um, understanding that there are limits to one's power, there are limits to what you can do with, state-sanctioned authority or mandates. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. It's like, a, it's, a, it's an asymptotic kind of thing, right? Like as, as you know, you, you try to resolve an injustice, you try to address a concern, a, a human rights concern or issue, another one pops up, right? A, a classical example of this is the, is the women's movement. Within the women's movement, you know, women's rights um, started with just demanding for voting and then it became you know abortion rights and then from the women's um, movement like a splinter into so many um, different groups uh, and different demands child care maternity uh, health benefits um, and now you know it's it's grown into a, a, a big movement a big global movement for equal pay equal opportunity um, and of course the me too movement as well so for people back then, fighting for women's rights, they thought that if they got women's rights, they would be, you know, they, they didn't have these um, issues in mind back then. Of course, many of them thought that women's rights were, was, was just the start, but that was already a very big victory. But that victory, that big victory is already the default now. And so you have new problems. New, and, and so one way of thinking about human rights is that it's a, it's a continuous dialogue between um, you know, the, the ideals we hold and the potential for abuse and the potential for injustice that's always there just beneath the surface. Um, so yeah, I mean, quantifying justice is a, a, a difficult task. I think torts and damages and, you know, um, paying someone uh, com- to, to compensate for the harm that they suffered uh, is the best approximation that we can get to restorative uh, justice at this point. Um, yeah. It's imperfect, definitely, uh, but it's as, as a symbolic uh, as a symbolic gesture. It's very powerful. Because, you know, you know, you know tech, tech people have a term for this. Eh? Uh, you, it's a meme. <laughs> when when you see something going wrong, you wanna ask, is this a feature or a bug? <laughs> so when you say, <laughs> sorry to laugh at it too much, but are human rights violations a feature of the system or is it a bug that needs to be fixed? No? Sometimes you don't know, means and if, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to <laughs> bring that up no, as a kind of a, the way tech people would think about these things. No? Yeah. Um, I, I, well, just 
just to really emphasize the point though, that the, the imbalance of power isn't just an abstract concept. Imbalance really threatens life no? really, or, or threatens the quality of living for so many people. Uh, so those who have the power to arrest, you know, and then this is, th th this is where like actual prescriptions come in, can only do so with a warrant or, you know, um, when a crime is being committed on plain view. So that at the end of the day, we sort of correct in some way, in some significant way, the, the power relations between what you see on your screen now, the policeman and the farmer. That's the, that's the ethos of human rights, um, which maybe we can, you know, delve into the topic of the presentation, which is the power relationships that govern data. We need to unpack this for us to be able to understand the role of human rights when it comes to data or their relationship uh, in general. So, so, so with, with this frame of mind, the relationship between human rights and data becomes a question of what are the power relations that govern data? What are the state's powers when it comes to data? Where do these powers lie? Who are the state agents or actors that embody this power? And thankfully, there exists an old human rights concept that can help unpack these questions. And this is, of course, uh, the right to privacy. Uh, the right to privacy is relatively new. Well, it's old, but it's relatively newer. Um, it's really born from American tradition, uh, or at least it's articulated best into American tradition. Um, privacy is a big word that gets thrown around a lot, especially in the tech space and made more prominent you know, recently with our increasing digital lives, um, ushered by the pandemic, of course. But privacy as a human right had the more um, rudimentary meaning and application. It's traditionally understood as the right to be left alone uh, or the right not to be surveilled. And this evolved with the advent of technology as well. And that's why it's still very uh, relevant now because perhaps its roots were really in trying to address an innovation and the uh, attendant problems with that innovation. Um, particularly with telephones and party lines. In, in the US, there was this case about um, telephones and telephones then being a community asset where you have you know one telephone for so, uh, serving so many people and where the government owned the telephone operator uh, operations back then. So again, it goes back to state power. Uh, the government was able to surveil and listen in on people's private conversations, something that didn't exist before. This problem wasn't there before. So privacy was born out of innovation um, or Privacy, rather, was born out of the problems that came with innovation. So privacy is, you know, so many related concepts. The right to be left alone, the right to autonomy, um, the right uh, freedom against mandatory disclosure, or to put it in other words, it's, it's really the freedom to choose what I disclose to other people uh, and the right not to be surveilled. But essentially, it's a consensus that individuals should not should be able to decide for themselves what information about themselves they will share, whether to a private person or to the government. So where are the sites of state power located when it comes to data? Ito yun. Dito tayo nakaka-problema ngayon kasi the government, or the state rather, really has a lot of opportunity to abuse um, privacy uh, or, 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 or the right to privacy because they do control a lot of um, elements of public life uh, that make it easy for them or make make them prone to abuse, such as the control of airwaves. Essentially, the state has a monopoly over the airwaves and thus the ABS-CBN shutdown um, you know, and regulation of franchises. There's also regulation through taxes and licenses, and this is where the coercive nature of, of the state comes in. There's monopoly over identity, right? From birth to marriage, to your NBI clearance, your driver's license, all milestones in your life up to your death will, will require state, um, state sanction. You know? So if you're not registered, are you really domin doc legal, right? Um, and, and, and it's the state that has control over that. Of course, administration of public goods also entail a lot of um, uh, data privacy issues. You know, we're all required to contribute to Healthcare, such as PhilHealth or Social Security, SSS, GSIS, 
um, even housing through pag-ibig. No? And perhaps the most problematic of all is the mandate over national security. The state really has uh, a core or um, an existential function to preserve itself. So this is where the state collects intelligence so um, from, from international aggression or even domestic threats to its existence like terrorism. And today we just have the second um, day for the oral uh, arguments for the Anti-Terrorism uh, Act or the ATA. Yeah. ATA, no. Just yeah. to just reacting to this, no. Uh, and I'll I'll take the kind of the citizens' perspective. Uh, I I would I can imagine uh, all these I would say co- structures, no control structures, were presumably put in place for kind of the orderly functioning of society. And sometimes that's the line some of the defenders of some of this uh, contentious issue state, no. So I don't know if, was there a point where, and this is highly subjective, by the way, was there a point where we took a wrong turn? I mean, not just particularly us, no? maybe governments in general. Now, now, these structures that were previously, you know, that previously served a function, like to, to ensure society functions properly. Uh, like, for example, young identity function. No? Uh, I mean, you can't go anywhere without identity documents. But then now it can be coercive. Uh, or even uh, something as fundamental as uh, privacy seems to be the first thing to go, you know, or collateral damage during a pandemic because you need to do contact tracing, something like that. No, parang I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering if maybe there, there's a misunderstanding somewhere, you no, know, maybe on the part of the people in implementing these laws, na yung core value nila is is out of the way na, no, and it's all about as you said, power structure in Asia. It's no longer ju- it's no longer just maintaining the wheels of society. You know? So I don't know. Was there ever a point where things go wrong that way? I don't know. The, if you have a perspective uh, like that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the folks working at the Martial Law Museum will have a lot to say about this. So, um, you know, to memorialize um, the human rights abuses uh, of martial law, uh, there was a lot of archiving that, 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 that the CHR and, and, and um, the folks handling the Martial Law Museum are, are doing right now. And they, they're slowly discovering how during Marcus's uh, Martial Law years, they were, uh, the military in particular were really collecting significant data against you know, political opponents or you know, insurgents, subversives, academics. And again, this also you know, is, is in connection with the the DND UP Accord because most of these people were from UP back then. Um, but yeah, there there was a point when there was a systematic um, uh, I don't know policy to collect data on political opponents, and that was during the Marcus uh, Marcus years. Um, right now, it seems benign, right? And when we enacted all these laws that put in place all these. Um, you know, data collection problem areas. We really didn't think about um, the potential for consolidating data and you know just amassing a wealth of data over a single person. When we enacted, let's say, the SSS law, we were thinking about a particular good, right? Um, which is social security. And then we enacted the field health law, and then and then we keep adding up to it, right? So over time we've really just surrendered a lot of our data and information to, to the government. It's not by design, but the potential for abuse is definitely there. Imagine if, you know, what, 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 what keeps the government working or what keeps our privacy protected uh, for the most part um, from government is that all of these are still paper copies. <laughs> these haven't been digitized yet, but imagine if all of these were digitized um, and then, you know, by, by, by decree or by, you know, by whim, they can be consolidated. I mean, yeah, who, who knows how, how these information against, uh, will be used against us. Um, fortunately, um, no one is still, no one from, from the state is asking us um, for our information or our preference on food or art or, you know, fashion. Wala pa naman ganun, although these are also very valuable personal sensitive information, right? Um, a lot of areas are still hands-off, um, like your 
gender or sexual orientation or sexual preference. Um, religion used to be um, hands off, but I, I, I think there are some state agencies, hospitals, uh, and universities who ask for someone's religion. I think for passports as well, they ask for your uh, religion, right? Um, for the most part, hands off pa mga ganitong really very personal information. Um, but yeah, we, the Anti-Terror Act, for instance, is, is scary because um, it provides cover for state agents to collect information against a, a perceived terrorist or a suspected terrorist. Um, and who knows what the bounds are. And this is being debated in the Supreme Court um, at the moment. Well, a few hours ago anyway. You made, you made a very good point about, uh, just before you move on, on, on the only thing keeping us safe is the relative lack of sophistication of the system. Everything is paper-based, PDF-based. Uh, so it's that's a weird asymmetry, no? Na, of course, we as a data practitioner, my bias will always be to lobby for for efficiency, no? So let's digitize everything. Let's you know bring everything to the to our repository. But then when you look at it from a from an abuse, a lens of abuse or lens of human rights. What you might end up just doing is making the abuse more efficient <laughs> because uh, now you've automated the process. Like, for example, and again, I'm not drawing any direct uh, connections to, to what I just said, no, but I think last December, was it November, there was news that the, the Cagayan Valley PNP was testing out a facial recognition system no, to, uh, to allow them to easy, more easily identify criminals. I mean, on, the, on paper, that looks... Perfectly, you know, interesting, no? cutting edge, avoid, uh, I mean, not, not counting the possible false positives you could get from that, no? but just the fact that, okay, wow, you're testing something, uh, fourth industrial revolution type of technology. But then you bring back this lens of possible red tagging and whatever, mis- mis- no, misidentification, and now you have a facial recognition system that, that helps, potentially helps that. I'm not saying they're doing that, but. Uh, there's just so many weird places that think and go to. No? And what we might end up doing is, and this is ha- has already happened in some fronts, tighter regulations result in less efficient you know, methods of, uh, of data management, uh, which doesn't really help anyone. No? So yeah. it's weird. It's not, a, it's not just one, parang one dimensional where you go from primitive to sophisticated. There's just so many other parts to that axis. No? Primitive but abusive or primitive, but you know, non-abusive and then efficiently abusive and efficiently non-abusive. Uh, and then there could be more, you know? I mean, it's just amazing how that, that can go. Uh, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, the government has our photos, you know, from, from the moment we apply for a passport, you know, some of them got like baby photos. Pa natin. Um, all the way through, I mean, getting NBI here. And so, so, you know, if they had the facial recognition technology, um, they can be very good at it, right? Um, and, you know, we see this happening in other jurisdictions already. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if the government, if our government, um, particularly the police, uh, will, will try out or push the boundaries uh, on the use and application of these uh, technologies. Um, of course, it will always be on the ambit naman of peace and order, right? But the very reason why peace and order should be difficult is that peace and or- um, enforcing peace and order is really, really prone to abuse. It's, it's such an easy, easy card to, 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 to raise, right? Um, that's why, you know, it, it's, it, it might be counterintuitive, um, but you should think of, human rights as well as making it difficult for the police to enforce law and order so that they'll be good at it within the parameters of uh, what they can or cannot do. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, this is this is state, right? This, what, what, what we're talking about is the state. Um, but what about, you know, interference um, or abuse from private individuals or private entities? Um, you know, where, where the government stops short of being completely, you know, prone to abuse um, is where private individuals or corporate, corporations rather, push the boundaries. 
So it's arguable that private entities, I'm not really sure about this, but it's argu uh, arguable that private entities collect and possess more data than, than, than government. I wouldn't really know. I, I have no way of knowing. Um, but they do collect massive droves of data for, for, for everyone. Um, and you know, it, it begs the question, should human rights also neutralize the power imbalance between a tech company on one hand and a, a tech user on the other? Um, you know, so between private individuals and another private individual, this is a, another challenge for human rights um, that has become more inevitable and we have to answer it. Um, but again, you know, this is ushered in by technology as with the uh, origins of the right to privacy. We're still being confronted with new challenges um, on privacy. Now um, at the forefront um, are tech companies uh, and private individuals. So, you know, for the most part, privacy issues and individual or private individuals were governed by contract law or damages or tort law, um, you know, contractual stipulations, do you agree to these terms and conditions? Uh, you know, and, and if there's a violation, you you seek damages. So that's really the, the regulation. But the but the right to privacy has now become a public issue when it comes to private entities. Due to the advent of social media, online, you know, our online lives in general, online shopping, and you know, now with our remote workplace conditions, we're we're really um, prone to to, to privacy and security issues. Um, and now we have the Data Privacy Act, no? uh, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, um, is the first time that really you, the right to privacy was articulated in terms that applied to private entities, right? Um, so we have a Data Privacy Act that um, you know, puts or imposes limits on private entities, either individuals or corporations. Um, but you know, the, the the question really is: Does this equalize the relationship between uh, the tech company and the user? Data is so amorphous and valuable, and can be processed in infinite ways, and entails infinite opportunities for circumvention as well. As you mentioned, Kanina Doc, you know, technology keeps on evolving. Um, and, and we're always playing catch up when it comes to legal norms uh, on human rights. And with innovation as um, you know, the driving force behind information technology, uh, can human rights really catch up? Can, can we really make you know, the power relationship between a tech company and its user um, balanced or equal? So yeah, so that's my parting thought. Um, and to jumpstart discussions in this, I think, uh, something to, to, to ponder about as well. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about private enterprise. Uh, I mean, uh, the easiest thing to think about would be social media, right? But I mean, one thing that people take for granted is many of our largest corporations are actually part of conglomerates. So if you have, a, let's say, a telco no? uh, that has data on your location, your, your private communications, uh, your preferences via your smartphone. And it's owned by the same people who own the bank, no? who know how much money you have, how much debts you have, etc. I mean, uh, it's, only a, it's only by virtue of their, I would say, magnanimity <laughs> or maybe their, their generosity that presumably that kind of data is not being used to, to abuse no? uh, uh, people. No? I mean, if you could connect telco. I mean, back when I was working in the IT industry, you know, I know challenge. No? If you could merge uh, data from various industries, no? and assuming you, you, you have the, the, the same counterparty, the power you could have is amazing. No? Uh, or let's not even look far. No? Like, uh, and this is not, this is not uh, confidential info. Like, you have like the SM group no? and they have something like the SM advantage card, which tracks all your purchases no? back in the day. And uh, you merge that with their, with their banking data. I'm not saying they do, no? but I just say, let's say they could. That's a, that's a surveillance at a level that, you know, people don't even, you know, don't even imagine. No? 
uh, every time you make a withdrawal from the ATM, you have a location. Every time you purchase something in SM, back in the day anyway at least, you have a location. So they can track you every, uh, in which whichever SM branch you go to. No? And, and they know how rich you are or how poor you are. They know what you buy. They know who you buy with. I mean, maybe again, the, the only thing keeping us safe is uh, and this is speaking from experience, these companies also struggle with managing that level of data. So they're relative. And I'm not sure if that's still the case today. You know? But back in the day, they, they really had a hard time. Uh, all these major conglomerates kind of stitching together and merging this information. But that's just a question of time, no? time, scales, and technology. Given the right investment, the right people, the right staffing, and with the emergence of the, this new occupation, you mga data scientists, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them had that capability already. Um, but is it being abused? Maybe that's the question. No? I don't know yet. I don't know if there's an obvious uh, you know, signs of it. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's also a question of imperative, right? Um, as markets mature, as you know, profit margins become more competitive, I mean, the imperative to use the data or to at least be able to process the data in, in really efficient ways um, becomes greater and greater. Um, but, you know, I, I just like to put things into perspective. The abuse of privacy rights by the state can result in you getting tortured, can result in you getting imprisoned, deprived of your liberty, even killed outright. Um, abuse of privacy by individuals or private entities might also lead you there, but not very likely. So it's in perspective that, you know, from a human rights standpoint, these are the, the glaring differences. I'm not saying that abuse of um, you know, privacy rights by private entities are any less evil. I'm just um, looking at it from you know, the, the perspective of a, a human rights lawyer um, who has uh, you know, witnessed how, what abuse looks like on the streets, in prisons. Um, but it's very serious in a way because it's so pervasive. Human rights abuses tend to happen in, in very small, um, or you know, there, there are vulnerable groups, but they tend to be very small. But in terms of scale, it's a private entity that's you know, broad and everyone is vulnerable to it. So that's the other perspective naman, um, for human rights and, and privacy. I guess the, and again, let's go back to the easy one, the easy target. That's where topics, for example, related to social media like Facebook become quite contentious because, well, clearly Facebook is a, is a private entity, but they, and, and it's not just Facebook, it's this whole slew of social media applications, TikTok, uh, and then recently the chats like mga WhatsApp. They're private, they're private uh, enterprises. They're basically commercial products, but they've been designed to be so endemic to society now. No? I mean, ev everyone's using them to the extent that the state's abuse can be through these applications, no? through, uh, I mean, to, to name the, the easy ones, no? like the, the Rohingya massacre or genocide in Myanmar was done through social media. Uh, there was lynch mobs in India through WhatsApp no? on fake news. And let's not think very far. No? The, this whole issue of political ads, not just in the US, no? but everywhere, even here, where potentially false information is being used to rile up you know, people for or against uh, I know, pe uh, uh, individuals. That's where it kind of gets blurred. And then, yeah. and then uh, I don't know if you have a perspective on... So that's one level of technology, no? something so pervasive like social media. And then it becomes a tool no? for, for, for state-sponsored uh, disinformation, terrorism, whatever you want to call it. And then there's another, a higher level where obviously something that's uh, prevalent in these networks is artificial intelligence. No? There are algorithms that without human agency, they're already pumping these messages to you no? based on how they were programmed. Now, even the original author of the algorithm may not even know that it's already causing fake news uh, echo chambers to circulate. And they will continue to, to optimize no, by design no? and as a result start 
you know, in a way harming human rights, no? <laughs> automated, an automated uh, violation of human rights, no? How do we deal with that? No, yun yung major question mark. No, I don't know. That's a, that's kind of a mouthful. So I don't know. What do you think of that? Yeah, artificial intelligence really is the, the frontier of human rights and privacy. Um, everyone's grappling with it because partly because human rights advocates don't understand it. We understand the implications. We don't know how it works. Um, so I think that's that's really a, a space that's um, that this is space for convergence that should happen already. The, 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 the data ethics people and the human rights folks, because to be honest, we can't respond with what we don't understand, right? But the implications to us are clear. If you spend, if, one, if one's public life is spent online and, you know, online is defined by artificial intelligence and there's no agency, there's no accountability, um, you don't know who to complain to, then, and all of this is mediated by, you know, a, a system that self-perpetuates and, so, and, and improves over time, then, 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 then what are our parang remedies? No? Human rights lawyers think in terms of remedies, but who's responsible for the efficiency that results from, you know, a, by design or from the system itself, um, an abuse, you know, an, an abuse that's carried out so efficiently that we don't really know who to blame anymore um, and what remedy you have. Uh, so that's an area where everyone is struggling, you know, governments, NGOs, lawyers in particular. Um, there hasn't been a, a landmark case yet um, in any jurisdiction that we can think of when it comes to human rights and um, and artificial intelligence. Although cases have been filed, we don't know how this will be resolved or what the outcome will be. Of course, there are congressional hearings that we're monitoring as well uh, in EU, uh, as well as in, in the United States. But again, you know, the question revolves around remedies, who's responsible, um, how, can we, how can we regulate it in such a way that we know um, when, when these violations occur. Sometimes we don't like we don't know we are being violated already, um, and 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 then that's the problem with artificial intelligence. I think. But dapat ano to? I think there's a conversation between tech people and human rights advocates, definitely on this topic, particularly here in the Philippines, because I don't think that 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 dialogue is is, is happening. That's why you know these episodes uh, and data ethics PH is, is very important. Yeah, just being conscious of time. No, I think we've we've uh, covered a lot of ground, and I don't know if we'll we'll actually be able to cover in uh, all the ground within one talk. No, but maybe we can have uh, a few more minutes on this one uh, concept. Ano pa ako, no? and tell me what you think of this, um, because obviously uh, these challenges uh, that we're facing now, these are you know we sim uh, the way I view them is they are symptoms of kind of an imperfect um, imperfect infrastructure basically and, and I'm not talking about tech infrastructure imperfect legal infrastructure imperfect societal infrastructure and and I've always been a big I mean ever since we started working together and I've always been big on the concept of the fourth industrial revolution where it's just so pervasive and sometimes it's so subtle you don't realize you're already in it and suddenly this, these spikes of data-related challenges, now whether you talk about disinformation, you talk about privacy, you talk about algorithmic uh, bias uh, and discrimination, are just for me symptoms that we're already in a new regime. No? We're, in, we're in a totally new uh, process or a totally new uh, era. Uh, but yeah, the, but, the, but the inertia <laughs> of our organizations, no? we're still... We're still in the uh, in the analog era. We're barely grasping the digital era. And then, what I'm worried about is, uh, I mean, we we worry about AI, but actually, AI is not even really there yet. No, it, it's just emerging. Most of the machine learning algorithms being deployed are rather simple ones. You know, you know, AIs that can play chess, <laughs> AIs that can play Go, uh, and then to a certain extent, AIs that can feed you information on Facebook. No, but at some point, it's just gonna 
grow exponentially. What do you think is a really, uh, I'm not saying foolproof, but what is a concrete step where human rights advocates can can really weigh in on this? No? Uh, and it's an open question or your thoughts on this, especially someone like you practicing in the sector. And maybe you can include the legal profession at end, no? because human rights has always been a legal, kind of heavy on the law. <laughs> uh, that's the toolkit. And it seems like the enemy, enemy, quote unquote, is coming from another sector, which is the tech sector. You know, how, how do you grapple with that? You know, um, yeah, good question. Right? It's, um, hmm. I think human rights advocates are really effective at if they have an individual that they can hold to account, right? I think that's um, like we've been trained to do it. Like we've been, we're, we can, we can smell a perpetrator from a mile away. Um, you know, so, so we are really, we have a nose for, you know, just getting at that person, at the perpetrator, holding that human rights abuser to account. So I think in response to your question, like it would, in terms of concrete um, um, actions or steps, is to never forget that behind the technology, behind the, behind the momentum, behind the narrative are individuals. And we need to articulate all the time who these individuals are, who are, you know, from shareholders to directors of corporations to even, you know, founders. We need to be able to pinpoint with, with certainty and with clarity who these people are at all times. Because sometimes the focus is on the technology, the focus is on the harm, the focus is, you know, but who's, who's the person behind it? Before we completely lose the person through artificial intelligence, we need to know now at this stage who's responsible for, you know, getting the ball rolling on these things. Um, yeah, so I think that would be one concrete way of um, making human rights more real in the tech space. Uh, yeah. I just realized now you mentioned discrimination. We have this um, interesting phenomenon on hiring where companies use, um, you know, scrape information to hire people. And that's very hard. I mean, it's so prone to abuse because, you know, if you can't exclude people with re this religious background or with this sexual orientation, they can definitely do that. And we've seen one app, I forgot the name now. Um, I just saw it in, 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 uh, in, in the news recently who's providing that service to certain conservative employers. Um, again, the people, the actual persons are important. And I think, you know, that's that's when human rights advocates uh, are most effective um, yeah, seeking accountability. Driving that accountability, no? And, uh, and ako, I'll be the first to admit, uh, because occasionally I've probably been guilty of this. When you talk to technologists, people from tech, there is this sense of I don't know, a morality or agnosticism, parang, parang you don't want to admit that technology can be inherently unethical or technology can be un inherently harmful, uh, especially if it was not conceived or it's being used for something that was not originally conceived for, no, <laughs> and uh, and to be and I don't know eh, how long that will persist. Eh. There are still people who deny, for example, that social networks are harmful and the blame rests on how people use it. But then you make a very powerful point that, wait a minute, the people who designed it should at least be aware that they've enabled a monster no? in terms of you know, a digital monster. But even if you see these documentaries, no? like The Social Dilemma, The Great Hack, there seems to be this parang reluctance to admit that they've unleashed something bad. Uh, and not until, and yun pa, uh, going back to one of our earlier discussion points, if the, if the penalty or the, the way you seek justice is in economic terms, some of these companies are just so big, they can afford anything, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. a, a one billion fee is a drop in the bucket for them. So yun na nga, your ability to, to enforce, uh, you know, because if you have a regulation, it redounds to all, Ultimately, that lang naman eh. You have penalties or you go to jail, something like that. No? Yeah. And they can never go to jail because they have the best legal talent defending them. So it's all about penalties. But they, some of them get so big that no, no penalty you can charge them will be harmful enough 
for them to stop. Mm-hmm. No, it seems like an open problem, <laughs> even yeah. for even for me. No, and, and I operate in that sector. It seems like a seems like an open ended problem that needs to be resolved. You know, at some point. Yeah. Well, antitrust lawsuits are being merged with human rights um, norms as well. Yeah, you break up monopolies because monopolies not only deprive consumers of choice, which is the traditional way of thinking about monopolies, or against monopolies rather, um, but because monopolies are more prone to committing human rights abuses. To, yeah, to abuse. So, yeah. Pero on the on the flip side of that, uh, as an ex banker, there can also be this. I would say the. The fallacy of the market, <laughs> yeah. where even if you had competitive forces at play, it does not necessarily reward ethical behavior. No, the there's the moral hazard. But I mean, it happens in in finance. You know, have all these uh, like I don't know if the if you're familiar with the the phenomena recently called GameStop. There is a stock that just went to the moon. Yeah, Robin Hood. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, exactly. That, short sellers, yeah. That's market forces for you. And how did they correct it? By meddling with market forces. They prevented people from, from buying or selling or something. And that for me is like, you know, I, I mean, I'm glad that it, it's correcting itself, but I'm not happy with the way they did it because yeah. you just violated the market. No? Parang, uh, and, and we're not even talking about local markets. I don't even know if uh, we can rely on local markets to be to be that objective no it's just a flawed system anywhere you look at it no <laughs> yeah okay okay um any i know any last words before we conclude thanks a lot Paco pala, no, for for sharing your insights this has been very it's a, it's a different kind of conversation and it's stuff that we love to, to promote no, in data ethics yeah no i mean we haven't really gone into how human rights advocacy or campaigning can benefit from from data development so could be a subject for for uh for another for talk right talk. yeah yeah but, we can talk yeah. for hours on this now but yeah let's save some for the next one but yeah definitely i mean we we're, we're sort of elaborating on the problem we need to have a chat about sort of possible solutions at some point no? yeah um siguro my my parting words um would be to encourage more engagement between or interfacing between the development sector and the tech people. Like we could all mutually benefit from from each other's parang expertise and you know outlooks. Uh, so yeah, I hope more more folks in, in 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 your space will join my space and the other way around. I yeah, think yeah. That, cross pollinate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, cross pollination of ideas. So there yeah, are, I, I there have are to admit, a lot of opportunities like, in, <laughs> in the development sector where oh, you're more, more, more than welcome to, to, to have more of our peers join in. No? Like I remember we had, uh, we had the Human Rights Summit a couple of months back. No? And we were kind of the oddball there. I felt like an oddball <laughs> being the only data and tech people talking in a group. But I think that was the intention no? to just you know, mix it up. Uh, and... You know, we didn't even cover this, but th- th- maybe another talk can cover this. Like even the development sector also struggles with the notion of of metrics, for example, monitoring and evaluation. It's a constant challenge. Uh, never mind the. I mean, we had that challenge in the commercial world. Like, how do you justify the ROI no, of a, let's say an analytics project? But our ROI there is quite straightforward. It's financial. You no, know? you spend and you earn more. But in in human rights or social development. What's the uh, what's the R? What's the return? Yeah. It's a bit abstract, no? You know, interesting, John. Okay, so so yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to cut it here. Thanks a lot, uh, Paho, for an enlightening uh, chat, and uh, hope to have you uh, over again uh, for another data ethics conversation. Yeah, thank you again. Thanks for having me. <laughs>